me know whenever we, we, yeah. we should start and then we can start. I am I was the music. Sure. Okay. First in Spanish and then I told them to start. Okay. Okay. Sure. Sounds great. Drink this water? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. This is just Thanks. for you. Thank you.
Thank you for thank you for having me. I mean, well, like what, what David said. Uh, thank you for coming to all of you. Um, yeah, I will I will talk a little bit about uh, my experience with Apache Beam and uh, like what 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 the fun things you can do with data. And uh, well, like I think we'll get started. So um, the first of all is first of all you need to have a focus on the right window. And then I want to start with just like a uh, kind of funny, interesting example. And I just want to ask uh, uh, this little thing. It could be anything. could have been Alexa. could have been, but in this case, it's a Google Home. And then you can ask the uh, kind of the question. Because how many, y how many of you have this uh, Oslo City Bike uh, similar thing? We have something in Oslo, which is called Oslo City Bike. I've seen something very similar in, in Madrid just today. It's like bikes you can just pick up and you can bike around and stuff like that, right? So, um, kind of dream scenario. You can ask like, hey Google, um, what are the uh, what, what's the bike availability uh, nec next to my home? Let's see if it works. Hey Google, what's the bike availability next to my home? There are five five bikes available at the moment. Based on historical data, the availability for this station will be decreasing for the next hour. I would suggest getting your bike within next 10 minutes. Nice, right? Uh, but the thing is, uh, it's kind of the dream. Because what, what it usually happens is kind of uh, different. So let's rewind a tiny little bit and just go back and like, kind of think of how it all started. Uh, just a disclaimer, I don't work for a project working on Oslo City Bike. I don't work with anything. I just needed some data to play with, so I ended up there. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more in a few, a few, a few minutes. So let's, re let's rewind. This is the Oslo City Bikes. They look like this. This is the same thing you see in San Francisco, and this is the picture I took today in Madrid. It was somewhere close to the city uh, center, I think. So those bikes are there everywhere, right? And then uh, you always uh, have an opportunity. You can buy, like, I don't know, I guess it's the same here, that you can buy an, a uh, kind of membership thing, and you have a card, and you can just, like, beep, and you pick a bike, and then you travel around, and it's very nice, right? It's very convenient. You can, uh, this is how Oslo City Bike sells their bikes to you. You have, like, na nice nature, nature beautiful uh, green uh, grass, and, like, you know, summer days and everything is happy and this is pretty much how it looks well at least half of the year in Oslo. Uh, the other half of the way it looks uh, ha half of the part uh, half of the year in Oslo it looks like this which is a little bit less nice but well funny enough they don't have those pictures on their side. But okay <laughs> let's go back to nice weather. Uh, so the nice weather is it's really cool. The idea is great right you have a membership you just go and beep that thing and you can get a bike, you can travel to wherever you want, you park your bike, and it's, perf it's perfect, right? But the thing is, uh, sometimes the thing is not really like this, because the stops 
usually it don't look like this with all the bikes and everything uh, ready waiting for you. Sometimes they're full so you cannot park your bike and sometimes they're empty so you cannot get any bike. And then you start kind of thinking like what can I do because like the moment you get to pick your bike and start biking there are no bikes and then you get a little bit sad and <laughs> then you start like okay fine you know what I'm, I know IT everybody stand back I'm gonna fix that. <laughs> and then you start kind of thinking, what can I do? And the kind of to illustrate the thought of like the, the, the process of thought, I had like I have a little slide here. So you start planning, you start thinking, what can you do with this thing? And then you start like, okay, well, what should we start with? Well, um we don't have any bikes. Well that kind of sucks. Um where can I find one? Well, really I don't know. Because, well, you have an app that shows you real-time things, but it doesn't show you wha how it's going to be when you like in those three minutes until you leave home and get to that station, right? And that sucks. And then you are like, okay, can I use the app? Well, I mean, not really, because again, it doesn't it show you right now, right there, and you're at home, and you still have like three minutes walk to the nearest station thingy. And by that time you walk, it everything is gone, and or everything is full. Um, Okay, so what can we do? We can use public API because, well, some of the APIs, they actually, uh, some of the services like this, they offer public API. So I don't know how it's in here in Madrid, but in Oslo, they actually offer pretty simple, very basic API that gives you a bunch of JSON data. Uh, well, maybe that might work. Okay. Um, can I collect historical data? Because I don't really want now picture, because that's all those uh, APIs give you now picture. But I don't want to do that. I want to have like the thing you heard in the beginning, saying like, well, based on historical data, because based on statistics for the last couple of weeks, uh, the availability is going down or going up. I would suggest you going and picking up your bike earlier or later and stuff like that. So I would like to, to, to collect some historical data. Okay, fine. What, what, how do I do that? Do I write like Python scripts? Do I do like, well, put it in a data warehouse, go full enterprise. I don't know, it's just like, it kind of sucks. Uh, because, well, all those things cost money and, well, you end up like having a huge, it's, everything starts, it started for me as well with a tiny little Raspberry Pi, but then kind of <laughs> you realize that Raspberry Pi is not enough. So then you have another one and another one, and then you have like a huge server rack running at home. The good thing, you don't really have to pay for like, uh, for warming up your house. The bad thing is a bit noisy. So um, <laughs> then, then you're like, okay, fine. What can we do? Um, should we write something custom? Should we write like a Python scripts and everything? Yes, you can do that. But then it's like it's really hard to maintain because you just it just grows and grows and grows and grows. Um, can we use something that's out there? And that is how I kind of got, got introduced to uh, to 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 Apache Beam. And then you were like, oh, yeah, well, yes, that, that works. Th I found something, and it works. And then, well, profit. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> just a couple of words about myself. Uh, David told you, introduced me already. Um, I work for a Norwegian consultancy company called Competos. I, uh, I um, work a consultant there, most of his job of the architecture, stuff like that. I am uh, quite uh, quite involved in JavaBin. I used to be leading that. Uh, JavaBin is Norwegian Java user group. It's just we have like our own name instead of Madrid Jug or anything. We have like Norwegian Jug, which is called uh, JavaBin. And uh, I used to lead that uh, for two years, and then we have this thing that after two years you have to pass it on to someone else. So I passed it on to someone else, and then I took over uh, JavaZone, which is our Jug organizer. So it's pretty big conference. You probably have seen like uh, some of our promotion videos and stuff like that because this is what pe people usually uh, is like, oh yeah, yeah, I've seen those videos. If you haven't, have a look. Uh, it's a tiny little conference in Oslo. It's around like 3,000 people <laughs> for, for two, three days. Uh, so, well, this is pretty, uh, pretty fun thing to organize. And it's all done vol by volunteers on like, uh, yeah, on spare time. And well, and uh, well, I'm also part of the Java Champions uh, the, the group. Uh, I, could, I, yeah, I became part of that a couple, like a bit more than a year ago now. So, enough about me. Uh, let's talk about the architecture, right? Because this is what we do. We IT people. We want to solve the problem. We want to make those uh, 
bicycles be available at the right time at the right place. So you end up with something like that. And it's like simple, simple version would be without streaming, would be just this. And this is what you end up, this is what I did first. I did that thing on my Raspberry Pi on, on, uh, on a tiny little machine running uh, Linux. So you have some kind of cron job that kind of runs every whatever. So mine runs every 15 minutes and dumps the data. Um, you put it on files, and then you have something else to pick up those files and do something with it. So you can use Apache Spark, you can use something else, doesn't really matter. Uh, you put it in some kind of data warehouse, so you just store it somehow, and then you see, look at that thing somehow. So it could be a Jupyter or whatever, whatever, it doesn't really matter. So the point is, you dump data to files, you process files the way you want, you store them in a way you want, and you show it in like graphs or whatever, right? But then one sunny day, one great, fantastic day, it hasn't happened yet, but like in the future, uh, when uh, Oslo City Bikes will offer streaming of data instead of showing like kind of half stale da data, uh, then you can put do something similar, right? You just do uh, some kind of queue of some kind, RabbitMQ, whatever, uh, put it in a storm or anything else, and then you put it on a dashboard that shows you like the availability, real-time picture compared to whatever and stuff like that, which is cool, right? seems to be working and this is what I started with and then I was having uh, this cron uh, job dumping data every 15 minutes so four times an hour just dumping the uh, data to, uh, to, 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 the, to, the, to the drive but then you get a little bit sad again because um, it's still your Raspberry Pi and it still runs on your table and sometimes it kind of dies and sometimes it's the network is down or things like that and then you lose a lot of data. You kind of want to have it on more on, on, on available all the time and th things like that. So you kind of want to not to manage all that yourself. But well, we'll get back to that later. Um, first, a little bit about Apache Beam. So I, note, uh, I mentioned that already. Uh, it's open source. It's uh, free uh, open source. Uh, the whole code and everything. It's been op open sourced by Google, if I remember it correctly, and uh, it has two ways of doing stuff. So it can do ba batch, like with files and stuff, and it can do also streaming. It has two uh, APIs, uh, two, yeah, well, two libraries, two APIs. You can do it the same thing in Python. You can do uh, things in Java. You can guess which one I chose. Well, I mean, I like Python as well, but, well, <laughs> Java is actually, for now, seems to be even more robust, so try that one first. Uh, and then you can put it in whatever you want. You can do it locally, uh, just run it on your machine. You can put it on some kind of cloud, uh, or you can do it some other like on-premise clouds and stuff like that. All right, um, so back to the architecture, right? This, is, this, is was, uh, this was the idea. So you have the cron job, or here you don't really have to have a cron job, it just comes in and then you process data. Uh, if you replace that thing with Apache Beam, you don't really have to have two lanes. Now you can actually join them together. So you just have like Apache Beam here uh, that kind of can, can consume both files and, 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 and streams, which is cool, right? Then you don't have to have complexity of two things running here. You put it all together. All right, that sounds good. And then you, we go back to this kind of uh, uh, don't want to run that thing on my own machine kind of thing. So if you want to put it in the cloud, for f in this case, I cho chose uh, Google Cloud because uh, Apache Beam works really, really smoothly on that one, but it pretty much should run on any cloud. And uh, it should work and without any problems and everything. Well, since Google, made all that and created all the whole thing, it runs really smoothly and they have like a managed version of Apache Beam on their cloud. So works for me. And well, I'm, I mostly work with this kind of, with this cl cloud. So that was kind of uh, given for me. But again, you can put it on anything else. So if you're gonna go with, uh, with any kind of cloud, you will go for some, some kind of cloud function. So serverless, uh, in this case, it's a cloud function. It's called, uh, Lambdas, it's called on, on the AWS, it's called, I think, like functions in Azure as well. So you put it something, you, uh, you, you use something to put it on files, on like some kind of bucket of some kind, 
uh, and then you use or you use some kind of queue uh, which is publisher subscriber kind of queue and then you put that thing into uh, Apache Beam running on your uh, either on in your Docker container or running already uh, managed for you or anything else you, you put it in some put it in some kind of database and you look at it somehow um, okay cool that's uh, that's really nice and it's like I mean the thing that was really uh, my experience, like first time trying Apache Beam, and then uh, I had like one thing. Uh, it in the beginning, it was really kind of difficult to, um, to 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 get the idea of what actually Apache Beam is doing. And you're like, well, I have this examples, it's counting words and stuff, but I don't really understand what what is it? What's it about? It's like uh, the 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 example that you get is like word count. So it has like a bunch of files. It eats them all counts all the words in those files and spits the out, out in, in the name. So the truth was actually, I, <laughs> I was kind of, okay, I want to learn Apache Beam. What do I do? And then I realized that I have this little project kind of running on, a, uh, on Raspberry Pi, dumping all that data of uh, city bikes. And then I was like, huh, I can put those two together. Um, so let's talk about Apache Beam. Let's talk about pipelines. So pipelines is something that is, uh, that's a kind of concept of Apache Beam, the way you process things. It can be, it doesn't matter how, what you put in, how you put things in a pipeline, it could be, uh, uh, it could be like uh, streams, it could be batch jobs, whatever. Just you put it in a pipe and then it kind of gets processed. So, uh, what is a pipeline? Well, according to Wikipedia is that. Uh, basically, it's just a, some kind of directed, directional graph so you have something here getting in, you have something getting out, and there are some things happening to it. Very simply put, right? And then you can, uh, you can sometimes put things together from the two different pipelines, or you can split them up, or something like that. In this example, it's super simple, so you don't really have to do that. So it here it's just one straight line going like input, do some magic to it, and output. So a very simple pipeline, right? Um, this is the data you get out of the API. Uh, so you get two, it has two endpoints. So one of them gives me uh, all the data about the station. So one particular stop uh, or like the station where you put bikes or pick up bikes, it has all this information. So it has some kind of ID, it shows if it's in service or not, it has some kind of title, subtitle, number of locks, and so on. So it has some kind of geographical coordinates, and then it, it has even like more fine-grained, uh, really nice coordinates, so you can actually draw a rectangle there. Or, well, uh, whatever. Which is cool, right? And for each station you would have this. And I think there should be around between two, three hundred stations around the city. So two, three hundred of those. And then you have, per each station, every, I think, 10 minutes, you get new data looking like this. You have the ID, which is the same as there. You have the avail availability of uh, how many bikes are available. Here you have no bikes at all, uh, but there are 10 locks. And uh, there is also some kind of overflow capacity. So basically, so you can actually set bikes there, even everything is locked. So you, they don't use all, all of the stations. Um, which is cool, right? But then, um, you have, imagine you dump all this data uh, four times an hour for a few months, and then you have a m huge amount of files, and then normally you would end up doing like writing Python scripts or something to par parse or the all that, and it would kind of, it would suck a little bit. Because you have to do that, you have to run it, you have to have a place to run it, you have to have your Raspberry Pi running, and well, it's kind of, that's probably the reason why I died the first time I tried to do anything about that. What happens is that I want to go from this, those two files with all this data and everything, to this. So, well, this is auto-generated, so it doesn't matter. Then you have an ID, you have av availability of bikes, you have availability of locks, and this is, I don't really use that much, this kind of data, but, well, it's there, cool. And also, I want to know when it's been uh, when the data uh, when when the data was generated. When because this thing it, it's like a ginormous, enormous, huge, super huge uh, JSON file, and there is a timestamp at the bottom saying like, well, this data was updated, blah. 
and it's kind of really nice if you have an app that kind of gets the information right there and right now, but if you do it um, uh, with historical data and you want to store it, it kind of sucks. So you want to go there, and then you want to, to transform your data from that thing to this. What you can do is uh, you can use Apache Beam, with what I did, and uh, y what I used for this is something called Pardo. Uh, Pardo is a parallel do, and it is something that lets you process things in parallel. Surprise, right? Um, it's pretty. Most of those things that I'm going to tell you are quite obvious for people who have done a lot of like functional and like uh, programming and things like that. Uh, if you haven't done that much, it's a little bit confusing in the beginning. So the data to be processed by this thing should be not depending on, uh, on, on each other. So a bunch of files with uh, historical data from this, the bikes is perfect for this because, well, I mean, I can read it by like 10 different machines and put in the same database and the data won't change, right? But then if you have some kind of data that's that needs to be uh, dependent on some other data, it won't work. So then you have to process it in one one line. But those parallelize really well. Um, the code uh, that I wrote is very little, is super little exciting. It's kind of almost boring. and But that was kind of the whole beauty of it, because it was so simple. Because I had this kind of aha uh, 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 from time to time, we just have this kind of uh, feeling, you know, it's like, oh wow, this is this is this is too scary because this is too simple. But well, it was. So you just create a tiny little class uh, that has the collection. The collection is something that uh, Apache Beam is uh, very fond of, and well, it's it's one of those things that you will see. This is kind of one of the uh, terms they use a lot, and you put all that into uh, into a collection. Uh, which is a link hash map of the stations, and here you do some magic in this class, extract from JSON, and basically what it does, it just extracts from JSON, puts it in some kind of data structure, and passes it on. And then uh, inside there, you would also do some kind of manipulations. You would transform things, you would get some data from the other files, you uh, put some more data in, into that uh, structure, and you can basically end up joining two JSON files in one, right? And add some more metadata, but because I have all the files that getting dumped every 15 minutes, it has a timestamp in the name. So I pick actually the timestamp from the name, and then I use that for uh, for 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 uh, for the database. Okay. So now I run that thing on my machine, and running on that on my, on my machine is pretty simple. So you just uh, you use Maven because it kind of auto generates Maven for you, or if you just download the example, it will have Maven in it. I think it also has Gradle. I'm not, I don't really remember. But well, the thing is, uh, it there is again, it's kind of getting really boring, right? You just have well, you just I'm going to run some comp compile stuff, and then uh, pdirect runner. That means that I'm running it locally on my machine. So this is uh, this is a, a setting to 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 Apache Beam. And then I'm telling you, I'm telling it also where the main class is. Well, that's that one. And if there are any arguments to that class, in this case, it's some kind of input file because, well, in this case, I'm just having only one simple file. I don't have the bunch of files. If you want to have a bunch of files, I think you can pretty much say source star dot txt. I think that's what I ended up doing at the end. And you want to somehow dump data locally, because for now we're running all on that machine, we process all that thing and we write to file. We don't use databases or anything anything fancy. Um, when I ported the same thing to, uh, to, to the cloud, uh, I'll, I'll jump back and forth in a second so you can actually see the, uh, the amount of things changing, but pretty much it's the same thing. You, have, you change this one from local to data flow, because the managed version of uh, Apache Beam is called Dataflow. Um, again, main class, arguments. In this case, you have a little bit more arguments. You say which project on your cloud uh, account is used, and then you have some kind of input files. So this is basically put picking up stuff for a, from a bucket. Uh, there, there you go, the star thing. So I pick up all this data for 2018. 
Uh, staging location is something that Apache Beam needs, but you pretty much won't see that much. Uh, you will see a bucket there and it will be full of some kind of files, but you don't really have to think about it that much. Output is not really that you really need to do anything about either. Um, and then you put temp location is also something that it needs internally to, to put some temp files somewhere, so it's fine. Uh, data flow runner, so you define a runner and you need to specify re region because uh, if your data, if, uh, because in this case I was putting data into a data database and if your database and your Apache Beam, uh, Beam job are in two different uh, regions, it won't work. It just fails with some mystical, very weird error. Uh, so it took some time and then we were like, oh, well, okay, we just need to do that. So, go, going back and forth. So you see it's pretty much the same thing, right? The first one is changing and you have some extra things that, because, well, you don't have the file system, so you need to have some kind of temp locations, temp buckets, so it would put this. Um, this is how it looked when I tried to put it uh, on the cloud. Uh, so again, uh, the cool thing is that if, if you do it locally, it won't sh show you the fancy graphs and stuff. If you put it in cloud, so I guess this is kind of way of making them like the cloud more or whatever, uh, they actually draw you a fancy cool graph. And as I told you, in this case, it's very kind of do one thing, another thing, another thing, and done. It's not like super fancy joining and splitting pipelines and stuff like that. So it's very simple pipeline. And uh, what happens is that the cool thing is happening here because I have quite a few files. I think I had like data for uh, four months or something. And uh, well, count it for yourself, right? Four or five months of data, four times an hour, 24 hours a day, and so on, so on. So it's quite a few files. Um, the cool thing was that I started the job and it was like running for a little bit and then they realized, well, there is too much of it. And then it kind of upped the number of workers and then it worked for a little bit more and it's kind of automatically uh, just upped the num number of workers on machines parsing and running that code to, to I think it was like 16 or 17 or something like that. And when it was done in, yeah, well, less than 15 minutes, it just like everything was killed and everything was nice. So it just started a bunch of virtual machines for me to do the processing and when it was done it was just like take them all down again. So if I would run the same amount of files and everything on my machine it will take quite a few more minutes and it will also be well it will be it will be probably a little bit warm. And the code and the pipeline and everything was not like super optimized. I was just like trying out things. Which is cool, right? Uh, and uh, so the, the, the thing is, the whole thing seems to be taken, yeah, elapsed time, 18 minutes. And by that time, it also dumped stuff to the database. So I, d I didn't really have to set up anything. Um, amount of data is not super impressive. It's like 40 megs. But it generates quite a few rows. So you have 1.1 million rows. So, well, I mean, it's not really big data, it's not even little big, but, well, it's, it's a kind of respective number of rows in the database, right? One million rows, yeah, well, that works. Um, and then you were like a little bit like this. You were like, oh, that was it? That, that <laughs> that's so easy? And uh, it kind of is, and I had this kind of, uh, exactly kind of this face uh, a few times while, while doing <laughs> this thing and trying it out, because I was like, okay. That was it. I, d I don't have to parse everything myself. I don't have to like make sure that everything runs myself and everything. No, it works. Okay, cool. And then I told about that to a colleague of mine. So uh, uh, I was like, oh wow, look at this super cool thing. It was like it just works, and uh, we just built this simple pipeline, and 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 it processes stuff and dumps it to the database and everything. And then he was like, ooh. Uh, I know about this cool database, which is also open source and like uh, free and everything, uh, called ArangoDB, that is able to pretty much consume all that data from anything, from files you generate, or in this case, it was um, it was BigQuery. So th this thing is actually yeah, it says BigQuery. Uh, so you can just create a connector and it will just eat all the data, uh, consume all that, and for example, generate maps. So then I could actually generate my own maps with um, some kind of average data of availability 
and where it is and just put it on map just like this because he was like okay give me give me access to the thing and then he just created his uh, little thing that would just make it work and then you kind of expand the pipeline right so instead of just dumping it to a database you actually split it up and you put it in the database and you send it to ArangoDB and then suddenly you have much more data out of the box and everything is you're still running on open source free kind of software which is really cool um, but then if we go back to the picture to the architecture um, this works right but then what about the streaming part because till now we've been working mostly with batch with just files so I have like a bunch of files and I process them and everything so what, what happens if I do streaming if I do streaming is well simple as well and then <laughs> I, I realized it was very simple but uh, how did I get there uh, so the way I got there is going from the batch looks like this right because you have a bunch of files so here it's just per day I had per hour doesn't really matter uh, it you just want to go to this and it's just data keeps on going and going and going and going and how does this work well the thing is that you can have an uh, can have some delays so the things will be different when you do streaming so the data <coughs> concerning 8 o'clock in the morning for this bike station here might arrive at, at, at 8 o'clock which is cool and then it might arrive at 8.30 because well because reasons because internet because the package got lost somewhere uh, or it was the the station was down or something like that or the data could even cl uh, come in at well around 2 in the noon and then you have to handle that so one beautiful day whenever uh, Oslo Citibike kind of offers this kind of streaming possibility what can we do uh, well <coughs> I kind of looked into that as well and then I looked into how this thing handles uh, how Apache Beam handles the streams as well um, first we need to think what we want to do with our data so what are you doing so in our uh, our case we're doing kind of this thing but so uh, like in 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 the most simple way you just have some kind of data in some kind of way you convert it to some kind of other way and you store it right and then you can also do something like uh aggregating and reducing data you you pick those two boxes and you put them in one so you kind of count things or whatever uh and then you can also do like super advanced fancy version of the same thing where you do all of the above plus a little bit more and then you p uh, store data right all that you can do with streaming and when when you <coughs> do it with streaming you have to um, there is a little trick that you need to kind of be aware of you need to think of a windows so you put normally you would do you would create a windows uh, for like time windowing and then you say well you know I have a window of data coming in between 9 and 10 t 10 and 11 and so on so on so that's how you separate them and then when you when you when you pick all that data you would put it in a proper bucket so the moment it arrives you just like look at it and I was like oh this is data from 11 o'clock fine put it there oh this thing is the data from there and then you put it there and then you kind of keep on keep on storing in different buckets and you kind of aggregate them later uh, another thing you can also do uh, kind of windowing depending on data typically you just think of uh, web application with uh, cookies with sessions and you want to do uh, application uh, you want to do aggregation based on 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 a, a session not on time right you don't really care how when the user did that but you want to know that this, this particular user did that so then you can do sessions depending on not on time but on like on a session which is also possible and uh, then you can do some magic and then this is again kind of really at some point it gets almost scary how, how simple it was and how when I tried to make it work so those things that I really liked is that like for example you can look at past five minutes of my window every minute so I, I every minute I look at my last five minutes and then you can just do like this you just like events you just apply a, a window and that sliding window of uh, five minutes every one minute it's almost like the way you speak right and and it just returns you that and again magic 
Uh, and then you can do things like you can actually write queries. For those of you who are really big fans, fans of databases, <laughs> you can actually write SQL or SQL-like queries on, on your data without actually having a database. You still have some kind of data structure, but you can actually write a uh, join like this, and it will still work, which is kind of still cool. I mean, well, some people don't like ri writing queries. Some do, so if you're that way inclined, have fun. Uh, and then, well, monkey again. Uh, and then you're like, wow, this is this is very simple, and this is this just works. So we kind of ended up uh, going from Raspberry Pi and like bunch of data and storing data on the file and like what I do with this thing to kind of automating the whole data flow without really having to think that much about it. And the other thing is that, that I told you, is that it, I used examples of, uh, of Google Cloud, but it doesn't have to be that. You can do it, uh, you can run the same thing on pretty much anything you want. So this is, this is the Google. Uh, so then you can put things on Amazon, you can put things on Hadoop, this is Kafka. And so you can, you can uh, both read and write to, data, to, to the data on, on pretty much any kind of cloud, and it would still work. Uh, and then you can swap the things, and then you can say, well, you know what, I, I'm, cr I'm getting some data from Google Cloud, some getting from some, some of this from the S3 bucket, some of the data is local, and it will still kind of put all those data together and just magically read all that, process it, and store it wherever you want. Yeah. And then the cool thing is that uh, most of the code, and I can show you a little bit of code, uh, and it's not that much re really code, but the examples and the, the example I used for, for, for this presentation is online, and it's just you're welcome to have a look, you're welcome to play around, you're welcome to, well, if you see something, just send a pull request or make some more fun with, or have some fun with data, well, knock yourselves out. And... Um, well, this is pretty much it. But I think now I want I will just show you really real quick uh, some code, and I would like to hear your questions. I mean, uh, let's let's do one thing um, just to check. Put both of your hands up. Okay, they're working. Cool. Now you put one down. Cool. This is how you ask questions. <laughs> so every everybody's hands work. This is good. So now. <laughs> You w do you have any questions, any comments, anything? Uh, uh, while I, I'll, I'll, I'll we kind of like to see code sometimes. So, the cost for what? Uh, I think, yeah. Oh yeah, of course, of course. Uh, to repeat the question, uh, what are the co costs for running things on a cloud? I don't really remember what it charged me, but I think for this 18 minutes of running things, it was like nearly nothing. It was like a uh, euro maybe or two. Uh, and then it like picked up 18 machines, processed all that and kind of took them down again. Uh, I don't really remember what it was, but I think it was like around 20, 15, 20 kronas, which is like you divided by 10, approximately, to get euros. So it's like one or two euros, I think. Uh, but I don't really remember because I, uh, yeah, I think it was something like that. So it was pretty much nothing. It just pr uh, takes for the processing power. So it just takes for those machines running. And I think it uses some kind of magic in the background. Since it's managed, it just it doesn't charge that much. And also they have Another thing that if you're going to run it on Google Cloud, just think of it is they also have this thing that kind of sustain usage discount. So the more you run, the cheaper it gets. So so the kind of to to, to uh, long story short, the question, the answer is it depends. <laughs> but I mean, the good thing, I mean, if you really want to, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not really. I didn't really kind of think that much about it, but if you want to make sure uh, that you don't spend too much. You can put uh, caps on the usage, and you can also use, the, they have like a pricing calculator online that just go in there and just type in m amounts of data and everything. It should give you a kind of ballpark of how much it will cost. 
uh, if you run the because what I do what I still have uh, now running uh, a cloud function and I'm using uh, some kind of bucket that constantly saves the data uh, four times uh, an hour and it still runs and I still don't remember if I got charged anything for that it's like uh, they charge for the amount the amount of data you store and it's like it's not that much so I'm pretty much sure I'm running it almost for free but I mean like this is a, this is kind of game scale right and normally it would be a bit more bigger scale and you would be but still it's, it's not much any other yes question over there uh, regarding the point that you were saying that every five sorry every minute you are uh, have a window for five minutes yes yeah. means that you are reprocessing what you have already processed or uh you might so you just need to do some kind of uh uh, I'm not sure. Actually, I'm, uh, we we would I would suggest to look into the documentation and make sure it's uh, it's giving you all the data for the last five minutes or all the new data. Since it's okay. a stream, I would wouldn't be surprised if it would actually give you n only the new like late late arrivers kind of thing. Okay. Uh, but if 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 it if it is, then you would just have to make sure that you don't uh, override da override di data or you just store it or whatever because uh, th this would give you five. Um, yeah, well, just uh, just have a look. Okay, uh, okay. It should, it, the, the API is pretty well documented, so uh, I th I wouldn't be surprised if it just gives you new data only, since it's a stream. Any other comments, thoughts, feelings, uh, questions, anything? Thank you. If some crash happens uh, suddenly in the middle of the computation, you can recover the state of the computation because you are maybe persisting that on a database or something, or is, is uh, everything in memory or, or, or what? I I'm just trying to remember what because I my <laughs> mine crashed quite a few times uh, because when I was just trying and trying and trying and just like crashing things, um, I think. I actually I'm not really sh I don't I just have to think how it was uh, because on locally I wouldn't really expect it to store that much but it it does it does store some temp uh, files and everything but I'm not I don't really remember right now if it's uh, using those temp files or it just kind of re overwrites them but I would expect something a bit more pretty robust on 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 the uh, in the cloud so if you're using an in the cloud it will be it stores things to the database and has the temp files and everything. I think it actually knows where it, how far it got. Because like if you, actually I would say yes when I think about it. Because I'm just trying to like kind of track back to what I what happened to me. And the thing is that when you run run all those examples, like every time you run them, it like it takes lo uh, shorter and shorter and shorter like amount of time. And I'm pretty sure that's because it's. Um, because it actually remembers where it is and kind of continues where it uh, where it picks up where it stops, but don't really quote me on that. I think it should I think it is like that, and I'm trying to uh, think what happened when I was running this thing, and I think it was like that. But try try it out. I think again. I mean, think. <laughs> yeah, have a look. Uh, yeah, there's a commentation. Look. We, can, yeah. we can check it out afterwards as well after the talk mm. as well. Just take a quick look. Okay, thanks. Hi. Um, I arrived later, so I don't know if you talk about that or not, but what's the advantage of using Apache Beam uh, instead of Spark, Flink, which are the engines that, that are running under the hood? Because, for example, with Flink, or I, don't, I think with Spark you can do that, but with Flink, the problem with uh, the, the yeah, recovery is yeah. very clear, because yeah, yeah, yeah. you have total control out of that, but in in Apache Beam, I don't know if this is which kind of abstraction. Because is well, Beam. I mean, I haven't used that much uh, Apache Beam and Spark myself, but the, the thing is that uh <coughs> uh, usually th it's it's a bit more tricky to build up those pipelines. So here, I mean, my experience was when w I've never used uh, things like that. I never tried anything, and ever usually I would end up writing a Python script or something to parse the data for me. And this was a very simple way of parsing. I mean, the code, the whole co code is just one file. And uh, most of it is just like picking up some configuration and stuff like that. And 
uh, the whole magic kind of happens in uh, this is options, so this is kind of way of providing options and this is process also city bike data so this is pretty much the whole thing that that happens and this is very kind of simple and there is a lot of magic things happening and the cool thing is also that it integrates with Apache Beam and uh, sp I mean all those things so you can uh, Hadoop also because you store data on like some kind of distributed thing because you have uh, uh, some kind of huge amounts of data and you can just suck it out of uh, whatever, wherever you store it and you, you process it. So to me that was kind of appealing was that it was very simple to to read and write and create the pipelines that kind of can scale up and down without really uh, having to think about that much. Because with 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 uh, with uh, Beam and all those, I think you have those, uh, what's the job names? Uh, uh, you have like, um, what's it? Sp uh, Pick jobs, isn't it? Like you have like a bunch of jobs that you have to create, which are a little bit complicated, and you have to make sure that they run, and you have to kind of run them on local on on your kind of cloud or your machines and everything. So that was for me. It was, but well, choose your poison, really, because I mean this is one of them, but you know it has some d d downsides. Then use something else. But this this was kind of my experience of trying things out with little experience of things and. It just worked, and I was like, I was again. I was like, for me, it was lots of kind of surprising moments where I was like, this is too simple. This should not work. And then you look at the data, it's like, huh, it actually processes it and actually gives me back data I want. Cool. Right. Thank you. Okay. So, well, just to show you a little bit of code. Um, this is just common, so this is more kind of where I put things and everything. Uh, this is main, this is not really interesting. This is pretty much where the magic happens. Well, this is uh, some <coughs> configuration stuff, and I kind of l created a few uh, configuration uh, parameters so I can like read the data from where I read it, where I store it, and I have like one I put it on a local file, the other one where I put it on, on, on into the database. And um, and actually one of the points with the Apache, well like not using just something like Apache Spark or anything, is that you can switch things so easily. You can just, you have all those connectors that are ready for you. And I think it's a bit more tricky if you, did usually you just have to kind of keep it within the uh, within the uh, Apache Beam, whatever, uh, walled garden kind of thing. But here you can just like, oh, well, I want a file. Okay, fine. You just add a parameter, say file, and it will be fine. And I want database. You just add another parameter. It just happens to run on a database and it's kind of nice. So a bunch of parameters, just like uh, options things. So it's not really, you don't really have to do those. And there is more, what is this thing? <coughs> Yeah, this is the code I showed you, extract from JSON, and if we go... Oh, it's really fun. There. Yeah, and as, as I told you, this is, this is where the... Uh, this is where, where the, all the extracting happens, right? So you just process elements, you just have one element, one element in my kind of world is a file, and then I do some stuff with it. I just like... Uh, put it all in, in, a, in a map, and then I just kind of read data from it. And then So this is a super primitive way. In Java, normally you would end up creating some kind of persistent data structure. You would do some more kind of uh, advanced things. If you wanted, you would kind of persist all the whole thing into, a, or well, uh, put it all thing in a class and in some kind of data structure and do some magic. I had a really small amount of data and very kind of structured, well-structured data, so I didn't really do that. I did it almost like you would do normally, I don't know, in a Python script or something. Just like dump the whole data, put it in a map, and just do some magic with it and do it. Because for me, it was just like get it, getting it done and without creating like super enterprise-y kind of Java version of that. Which I could, but well, you know. Now I have the good thing, now I have one big file <laughs> containing all. <laughs> uh, but well, you know. Uh, and the, it has a pretty okay uh, readme, which is which you will see on 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 GitHub, which explains how to run it in um, 
locally when you have it on on with some Google Cloud and with what you have to do to make it run. And I even included some kind of example files here in resources. This should be like a tiny little piece of data just so to get you started. Yeah. Very nice. Without like formatting and everything. It's just like one big line. It's a very long one. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, I think if you if you have any com uh, questions, any comments or anything, this is me on Twitter. This is me on a bit kind of more traditional social network called email. And uh, well, this is me online anyway. So and well, I guess we can chat afterwards uh, here. And we have a couple of things to check out in the documentation with a few of you guys. So it's going to be fun. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Do you want to? Ah, si tenemos esto, no pasa nada. It's okay. Don't rush. <laughs> Bueno, sabéis lo que viene ahora, ¿no? ¿Quién no sabe lo que viene ahora? Bien. Vale, vamos, eh, sabéis que todos los, eh, todos los, eh, en todos los Meetup sorteamos una licencia de uno de nuestros patrocinadores, que es Brains. Entonces, para esto, para, para que no sea un sorteo, eh, lo que vamos a hacer es jugarnos, ¿vale? Vamos a hacer una pequeña, un pequeño concurso, ¿vale? Este concurso es muy sencillo, ¿vale? Y de hecho, esta vez lo hemos cambiado un poco. ¿Vale? De hecho, no sé por qué lo estoy utilizando por aquí, si al final esto es para aquí. Entonces, de hecho, podemos cortar la, el streaming. Para que se te oiga, David. Ah, no, es porque tiene, tiene, un, tiene una gracia. Uh, vale, uh, en esta ocasión, ¿vale? lo que vamos a hacer es... Lo que tenéis que hacer es sacar vuestro móvil, ¿vale? apuntar a kahoot.it y uh, introducir este argumento. Lo que van a ir saliendo son una serie de preguntas ¿vale? con cuatro posibles respuestas. ¿vale? La pregunta va a aparecer aquí durante unos segundos y luego aparecerá la pregunta arriba y las cuatro opciones con colores y con figuras aquí. ¿vale? Y en vuestro móvil tendréis el pulsador ¿vale? para seleccionar la respuesta correcta. Hoy vamos a hacerlo de una forma un poco especial. ¿vale? Hoy tenemos un Kahoot un poco especial. <risa> Habitualmente hacemos, sabéis que hacemos unas preguntas que tienen que ver con la charla que acabamos de ver. Pero, como lo hemos montado tan rápido, no hemos tenido tiempo para hacerlo. Entonces teníamos preparado algún uh, Kahoot genérico. Entonces, cuidado porque no es como estáis acostumbrados, ¿vale? El funcionamiento es el mismo, una pregunta, cuatro respuestas, 20 segundos, pero, pero, hay algunas preguntas que tienen solo una respuesta válida, ¿vale? hay algunas preguntas que son un poco tricky, ¿vale? Y hay algunas preguntas que tienen más de una respuesta válida. Solo tenéis que responder una, que quiere decir que todos los que respondáis a una de las válidas es correcto. ¿Vale? Entonces, bueno, van a ser 12 preguntas, van a ser genéricas, ¿vale? Sobre el jazz y sobre Java. ¿Vale? ¿Estamos todos listos? ¿Hay alguien que no haya entrado todavía presentando? Voy a hacer una cosa porque... Eso es. Esto no tiene la misma gracia si lo ponemos sin sonido. Esto que es una cosa, ¿vale? Porque genera un poquito más de estrés, un poquito más de...
Estás por ir de prisa. Estás por ir de prisa. Bien, bueno. Vamos a ver cómo está la clasificación. Eh, recordad, cada pregunta son mil puntos y la respuesta es por velocidad. Bueno. ¿Quién es JID? Vamos a empezar a poner normas como si no ponéis nombre de ¿Quién es JID? ¿Quién es JID? José Ignacio. Bueno, no os fiéis porque esto cambia muy, cambia muy rápido. ¿eh? Bueno, segunda pregunta. Bueno, vamos con la siguiente. No os preocupéis porque esto cambia muy rápido, ¿eh? <risa> Gracias. 
con quizá parte de ese Pero efectivamente la última. El primo es el tablet de poner arrastros, como digo. Que va a ser demasiado fácil. Que va a ser demasiado fácil. ¿Vale? Efectivamente la última charla fue la que dieron Jorge Morales y Ramón Gordillo sobre, sobre Master in Java in Container. Bueno, vamos a ver cómo va. Sigue Edu ahí bien agarrado, pero ya tenemos a Dani por ahí. A ver. Bueno, seguimos. Estamos a la mitad, ¿eh? o sea que todavía queda. Hay partido.
voy a saltar, ¿eh? Vamos a utilizarlo con, el, con un más random de toda la vida.
Bueno, eh, cerramos con un par de anuncios. Te encuentro en... ¿Vale? Tenemos ya preparado el próximo mitad, ¿vale? Eh, resulta que en diciembre, antes de irnos, ¿vale? ya avisamos que íbamos a tener una siguiente edición. Está publicado, pero no anunciado. Entonces, vamos a anunciarlo exactamente ahora. ¿Vale? Básicamente, vamos a aprovechar la semana que viene. Eh, tenemos por aquí también a... Eh, tenemos a Miguel Blanco, que viene, viene a nuestras oficinas. Entonces, pues aprovechando que está por aquí, tendremos una charla. Le hemos pedido que nos dé una charla sobre decomposición de aplicaciones SAP. ¿vale? Esto básicamente es lo que él ha traído, es una charla que está dando habitualmente en, en conferencias ahora y esto es lo que nos promete que vamos a aprender si venimos, ¿vale? Cómo diseñar aplicaciones que evolucionen en el tiempo y que sean comprensibles, diferentes formas de componer aplicaciones que estaban componentes reutilizables eh, y en qué se diferencia una API de un SPD. La idea es, vamos a empezar a trabajar en, o nos va a enseñar cómo poder descomponer aplicaciones, bien sea para hacer módulos, para hacer microservicios o para hacer simplemente librerías, ¿vale? Librerías que se puedan descomponer. Tenéis por aquí el abstract, ¿vale? La gracia de esto es que eh, Milen va a dar la charla también en el Windows 40 Library, entonces lo que hemos hecho es como una charla, en vez de una charla sobre Java, lo que hemos hecho es vamos a convocarla conjuntamente con el Windows 40 Library de Madrid, ¿vale? Entonces el viernes que viene, apuntaros y... Muchas gracias a todos por venir. Let's take the rest of our input. Here. And now it's time for the viewers and, and the working.
to hear a thunder in message to location. Thank you. I think I, I will also try to find out. Don't forget the. Yeah, the yeah I have my, my oh, okay. there. Yeah. I think the, the touristic trend uh, takes uh, uh, bus from Plaza Socorro Bed, from one of the main squares of, yeah. of Toledo. But I won't check, uh, check it out Thank and I will tell you. Thank you. Because very much. it's a long walk and yeah. it's, uh, it's a lovely yeah. hill. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Cool. Uh, uh, yeah. I've been to Barcelona a few times for the Yeah, like I three, four times or something, but uh, I haven't been to, to Madrid. We definitely need to, to work on, on yeah, 